Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and this is the concluding video, the grand finale video on our series, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. We have only four verses remaining on our list of 101. So the other 97 verses that we've discussed in all the previous videos, I, I, I hope you will go back and watch the series from the beginning. And more than anything, I hope that you'll use this series as a tool to give to those people who don't understand or agree with the doctrine of salvation by faith alone without any works required. Um, all right, brother, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of, uh, you know how you always summarize uh, the, the discussion, uh, so you can summarize it as you normally do, and then I'm going to kind of summarize the entire series here a little bit uh, in the, in the, when we finish up. So uh, let's get started. The first uh, verse on our list today is Galatians 3.24. So let me plug that in to Bible Gateway. Okay. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Well, Galatians 3 is a great chapter to distinguish between the law and God's grace through faith and what saves our faith in Jesus Christ and what doesn't save the law. Um, you know, what has life, eternal life, Jesus Christ, and we put our faith in him for salvation. What doesn't have life, the law. And so Paul goes through this to point out that the law is good. It just doesn't have any life. Uh, there's no salvation found in it by following the law because we all fall in short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. We failed at keeping the law. So God stepped in and manifest in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to fulfill our part of the covenant, the everlasting covenant that he had with mankind. And so Paul is showing what the law is for. It's not to keep perfectly, but to show that we can't keep perfectly and to use it as a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, but it's by faith in Christ Jesus. And so this is what Paul is uh, relating to the Church of Galatia here. Mm -hmm. Well, um, now that we're on the grand finale, and uh, I, I think of all the ground that we've covered, and many of the points that, uh, that we've made, uh, we've actually repeated the same points over and over again uh, throughout this whole series. Uh, the point I'm going to make right now, um, I covered, I think, pretty exhaustively in the very last video uh, regarding the law. Uh, and so I won't go into as much detail, but I'll, I'll just recap this briefly. That um, this is, Paul is referring to uh, the law uh, was our schoolmaster. Um, Paul was a, a, a Jew, uh, a Pharisee, uh, a scholar of uh, Judaism and the Mosaic laws. Uh, he even boasted that he didn't think anybody kept the law any better than him. He had done it as perfectly as possible. But um, so he was. Um, not only very, very familiar with everything regarding the law, but we've got to keep in mind that the law that he's referring to is not the law that's written on our hearts, the, the, the law that, uh, that God gave us as a, as a conscience. Every person is born with an innate understanding of right and wrong. Uh, that's what God gave the world. 
But the law that Paul is referring to here is the law that specifically that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and that was um, uh, then later elaborated even more uh, rather than just 10, but a total of 613. These are the laws that were given to the nation of Israel, uh, uh, the Mosaic laws. And I guess it, it's important to understand that those laws were not given to the world, they were given to the nation of Israel. The law that was given to the world was the law of conscience. And, and uh, every person has no excuse because the law is written in our heart uh, and we all have experienced guilty consciences. Um, but so that's number one. Uh, and uh, number two, the law we, we've stated over and over again, that the law that was uh, uh, given to Israel, that was never intended to be a uh, part of a formula for uh, uh, gaining salvation. Uh, it, it was never intended for that purpose. Uh, the purpose of the law in, uh, for Israel was if you follow these laws that God has given Israel, um, Israelites, you will be blessed. You'll have health, you'll have wealth, you'll have success in life, you'll even make it to the promised land. But um, it was not intended to make it to get to heaven that way. It was not intended to earn eternal life by following the law. So that's important for everybody to understand. And I think it's, it's probably the, maybe the most misunderstood thing in, in all of uh, religion, in all of uh, Judaism, and all of Christianity. That is the biggest mistake, I guess. Uh, so the, the law serves a purpose of, hey, it's a guide for us so that we can live better lives and also uh, be, by doing things right, we'll be blessed. Our lives will be better. It's kind of like the the, the doctrine or the, the, the principle of reaping and sowing. Uh, if, if you do good things, you're going to get good results. You do bad things, you're going to get bad consequences. Um, but the law also serves another purpose, and that's what Paul is referring to in this verse when he calls it the schoolmaster. Um, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, schoolmaster, I guess it's, it's an old term. I, I mean, I never used the word schoolmaster except referring to this verse, you know. Uh, I guess today we just say our teacher. The law was our teacher uh, to teach us something, to teach us our need for Christ. And that's the Paul, point that Paul's making. And, and that's the point that Jesus made over and over again. He used the law. And he even um, made the law even more difficult by saying, not only is it against the law for you to commit adultery, but it's against the law for you to even think about it. <laughs> he wanted to make sure everybody understood the impossibility of following the law perfectly. And uh, then because of that teaching by Jesus, his apostles said, oh, what? It, 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 you're, you're making it impossible. How is it possible for anybody to get saved then? And he says, you got it. You, you get it now. It is impossible with man, but with God it's possible. So he wanted Jesus and Paul here, both they, they want us to understand that, that um, for man to gain salvation through his own efforts by being religious or following the laws was impossible. But the law could do one really good thing for us, make us understand our need for Christ, our need for a Savior, and Jesus is the only Savior. So uh, that's the important thing to realize about the law. And then it says that we might be justified by faith. Now, justified, we've said over and over again, it's kind of a play on the word, but it means just justified is just as if I'd never sinned. So when we put our faith in Jesus, God looks at me and, and, and he sees me just as if I had never sinned. I'm just as holy and righteous as Jesus because all my sins were paid for by Jesus. So I'm justified uh, and I'm going to go to heaven because of my faith in Jesus. I, I'm not accountable, I'm not held accountable for any sin. Jesus paid for them all. Um, all right, brother, uh, any more thoughts on that? I'll just continue by reading the next two verses just to make it 
even more clear through context in verse 25 after the one we just covered it says but after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster for you are all the children of god by faith in christ jesus so it's by faith are we children of god not by following the law and if we use the law lawfully and use it as a teacher to Christ, then we're no, no longer under it. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't follow the law and that we don't think the law is good. Uh, just like you mentioned, you know, the, the law was given for the children of Israel so that if they followed these commandments, that they as a nation and as individuals would be blessed and receive the blessings of God. The same thing goes today. You know, Father knows best, as we talked about the other day. He knows what sin leads to. It leads to bad consequences for us. And he doesn't want that for his children. And so as a child of God, we understand that. We understand as a believer in Christ, after having the law lead us to Christ, we understand the goodness and the perfection of the law better than ever. We just don't trust in it for salvation. That's the point I want to make there. Hmm. Uh, okay. Um, I was going to plug in the next verse there. Uh, uh, I got a little bit confused here. Uh, let me go back to my Bible gateway here. Oh, I, I, what I wanted to say regarding this were, you know, I cited Galatians. 324 and then you said well let's get context uh, let's look at more of these verses in galatians and then i'll get i'll suggest even more context and i will um i'll actually put put forth a challenge to to everybody uh and that is that if anybody doesn't understand or agree that we're saved by faith without works then i i just want you to read the entire book of galatians uh, I don't know, brother, how anybody could read the book of Galatians and come away with any other conclusion. Uh, I mean, that is the whole point of the book. Because, as we've said many times, um, I, I think, I don't know, you've never given me your opinion on this, so I don't know if you've um, you know, followed up and, and actually considered this to, to see if you agree. But, uh, brother Bill, uh, told me about this, and I, I looked into it, and I, I, I agree. I think that when Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, if we go b uh, backward from that verse, even a, a chapter to just read a whole thing in context with, with the thought in mind, what is this thorn in Paul's flesh? And uh, in modern vernacular, uh, I would say, it's a, he's a pain in my ass. You know, Paul is referring to false teachers and all the churches Paul plants and uh, Paul has to continually write them letters to, and go back and, and, and revisit them saying, how can you forget? This is what Galatians is all about. How can you so quickly forget what I taught you? That all you need is Jesus, not religion. And yet these false teachers are coming in teaching you another gospel. That's a false gospel, and and, uh, and you're, so I, he has to go back and continually uh, fix the mess that the false teachers are, are causing in all of his churches. So I believe the false teachers are following Paul around wherever he goes, being a pain in his ass or a thorn in his flesh to him, a great annoyance uh, by uh, spoiling his teaching, and he has to keep going back to. Explain they're false teachers don't listen to them uh, So that's really what the book of Galatians is all about. It's uh, Paul trying to drive home the point is I told you You're saved by just trusting Jesus believe that your sins are paid for and the sin problems resolved completely uh, And God will see sees you as holy and righteous and sinless because Jesus paid for your sins and he he proved he was successful by raising himself from the dead as a sign to give us proof so that our faith in him is justified. Uh, and, and 
And uh, you should have understood that mosaic laws, circumcision, the dietary laws, animal sacrifices, all these things no longer apply to, gen to the Jewish people, and especially they don't apply to the Gentiles. They never apply to Gentiles, and even for the Jewish people. They, you need to discard that, leave it behind. It's no longer valid. Uh, so that's really what the book of Galatians is, is all about. And if anybody reads the book of Galatians, book of Galatians, I don't understand. Maybe you can help me with it. How could anybody, if they've read Galatians, ever be a lordship salvationist, brother? Spiritual blindness through unbelief. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, you know, they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And, and what is obvious um, in the pages are twisted and they rest with scripture. They're ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth because of unbelief and hypocrisy. Hmm. They're trusting in themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to post the next verse here. Uh, it's uh, Hebrews uh, 9, verses 12, 13, and 14. Neither by the blood of goats or in calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and, and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serving the living God? And we can continue one more verse in for this cause. He is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So again, showing a distinction between the law and through faith. And, you know, the book of Hebrews is one of the best books on eternal security in Christ in the entire Bible, but people will use verses within it to try to teach just the opposite. But Jesus Christ died once and for all for the sins of the world. And this is showing that he is the New Testament. Like we said, you know, he he brought in this new covenant. We failed at keeping the old covenant. So God did our part too in the person of Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh in Jesus Christ and we put our faith in what he did that he fulfilled the law and we use the law again just like the last passage that we looked at as the schoolmaster to lead us to him and that's what um, Hebrews is telling the Hebrews that are confused because like you said there were a lot of thorns in the flesh that were coming in and telling these churches that Paul was establishing that no 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 you still have to be circumcised and you still have to follow um you know these these levitical priesthood rites and rituals and animal sacrifices and you know paul is going over and over that no you don't you know and you never did for salvation that was just a picture a shadow of jesus christ and then goes on to say the blood of goats and calves never saved anyone. You know, it's always been by faith in, in God, in the Redeemer to come before the cross. And we know that name is Jesus Christ now. Um, and then it goes on in 14 that he offered himself without spot, you know, the just for the unjust. And he purged us from dead works. He purged us from our sins, our transgressions. Um, you know, the works of the law and doing all those things. And, you know, we look at examples today of people trying to establish their own righteousness within religion and doing all these religious sacraments and, and all this stuff, you know, those are dead works. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, 
in him alone and you're not trusting in anything else, if you're trusting in those works, then, you know, repent from that, repent from those dead works and faith towards God, you know, repent from, you know, all these, all these works and trusting in yourself that you're doing and turn to him. You know, that's, that's, repenting unto salvation is going from unbelief trusting in yourself or whatever else you're trusting in to trusting in jesus christ and so that is the point of hebrews uh we've we've talked uh many times before about um, which books of the bible are most pertinent to this um gospel that the, the message that this whole series is about is that man's religious works as a contribution to, for their salvation is nothing. It's, God says it's filthy rags. It's, it, it's, if, if we present our works to him to justify ourselves to get to heaven, he's disgusted by it. It's like giving him filthy rags. Um, and the only thing that pleases God, but the Bible says is without faith, it's impossible to please God. So this that's, this whole series is is to drive home this point. And now 101 verses. Uh, if we wanted to, we could probably go through. Uh, you know, all, the whole. I've already done this the verse by verse. The the, um, the Gospel of John. I mean, there's hundreds of verses in there that would could fit, we could fit into this series. Um, as we continue on through the, the Pauline epistles, so you're going to find so many more verses that could be used for this purpose. So the, here, this series is 101 verses, but the, the Bible is full. There's, I'm, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands of verses that will prove the point that we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and don't dare insult God by presenting your works uh, for your justification. Uh, so I would say that, as I've said before, you get this mainly from the Gospel of John, uh, the book of Galatians, the book of Hebrews, uh, I'll include Romans too. Uh, I say if we had those four books and a perfect person just studied and focused on those four books right there, uh, there's, they're going to be so secure. In their faith and their and their assurance that they'll really have joy like a how is it joy uh, peace like a river and joy like a fountain that great blessed assurance that we we enjoy I want that for everybody um, but before we go on uh, you you again you keep on insisting on giving us context brother. Yeah, so you said, let's look at the next verse. Well, let's go on and look at even more here because I think this is a very important thing for people to understand too. Um, you said, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Uh, that's the verse you mentioned. So I'll talk about that, but I want to go out and cover the, the 16 and 17 also. And that is that when um, I don't know if this is the time I maybe you can find out quickly the, the, the phrase New Testament. Is this the first time we see the term New Testament in the Bible? I don't know, but we talked about dispensationalism, especially I've harped against hyper dispensationalism, but I don't like dispensationalism, basically how anybody defines it, except we, we, we uh, define it as God throughout history dispensing more and more information to us so that we understand better his plan for salvation. Over time, God revealed more to us and now um, not only do we know his, his plan for our salvation but now we know that he's completed the plan it's all it's finished all we need to do is believe that god fulfilled the plan 
accomplished it for us and trust God for our salvation, Jesus Christ as our Savior God specifically. Uh, but the, the, the term New Testament, uh, I believe that is the dividing line that I will agree to. You're not, I'm not going to let people chop up the Bible into seven different periods where God had different programs, different administrations, different systems of salvation for the world. Uh, um, it's always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, except they didn't know his name was Jesus Christ yet. They just knew God would be their, provide the Savior. Uh, so I'm not going to ever agree for the people who want to chop it up into seven dispensations or more or less, I certainly am not going to agree that um, in hyper dispensation where they now they were basically saying, "Well, forget about all the books of the Old Testament. Forget about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For, forget about uh, the other epistles and, and Revelation and anything else except for what the Apostle Paul wrote." These people who teach that. In Paul-onlyism, I find it repulsive to me that they would, as much as I love Paul, and I'll boast about Paul as much as anybody, I think, saying that he was unique and supremely important. He was the apostle that said, not only have you been told that you're saved by faith, but don't you dare spoil it and ruin it by adding your filthy works to it as a faith plus works. That's, that was Paul's role, to emphasize, don't even think that your work's contributing at all, or else you're not going to even be saved. So, yeah, Paul was so important serving that purpose. But people who don't understand that we can read the red letters, the words of Jesus, and be saved. We can read the Gospel of John and be saved. We can read uh, the preaching of Paul and uh, Peter and be saved. His preaching, if you read his preaching, he's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection and saved by grace and faith. That's it. They all agreed that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So uh, the, the dividing point that I will concede and say, and happily say, yeah, there's a clear division. And it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the Old Testament doesn't begin with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. I mean, the New Testament doesn't begin there. The New Testament begins, as it says here, Paul tells us, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, Paul tells us, tells us that uh, in verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a, <clears throat> a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, here, I've got a document here. Within these papers here, I have something called Luke's Last Will and Testament. It's secret, though. I'm not going to tell you what's in there. But everything I put down in there... It doesn't apply to right now because I'm alive. None of it goes into effect until I die. That's when my last will and testament kicks into effect. It's the same thing. This is what this is referring to. The, the New Testament only goes into effect at the death of the testator, and that's Jesus Christ. So the New Testament begins at the death of Jesus. Uh, and so we have... The Old Testament is all the prophets talked about someday in the future, God will provide a Savior. The Old Testament, the New Testament says he did it. He provided the Savior. And, and it's Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. And at that death, that death served as the payment for our sin. So that death is what separates the, the promise from the fulfillment. It is finished. Uh, all right, brother. Any more thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, Jesus Christ is the New Testament and what he did for us, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And, you know, you, you mentioned Testament. It's, um, you know, mentioned three times 
in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke by Jesus referring it as the New Testament. He was talking about his blood, you know, his death, burial, and resurrection to die for our sins. You know, in Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Um, and goes on and says these same things. And then Paul quotes this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, uh, which we hear oftentimes being um, read at the time of the Lord's Supper, when as Christians take the Lord's Supper, um, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And you know, so the blood matters, like we talked about the uh, other day. Um, you know, that's where redemption is found and what he did for us. And the death of a testator is when that testament uh, goes into effect. And, and, you know, that is the um, fulfillment of the Old Testament that was always a shadow and pointing to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right, brother. I guess we're ready to go to the next verse here. Only two verses remaining in the countdown. So this one is Hebrews 6 1. Okay, and it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. I'll just keep reading a little bit. Uh, it says, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. All right, so this is just what we talked about. Um, you know, this is three chapters prior to the last passage that we read in Hebrews 9, but it discusses the same thing, that um, it's the blood of Jesus that purged our conscience from dead works uh, and faith unto God. You know, this is Paul continuing this message to the Hebrews who weren't doing a very good job of it because they were getting back under the bondage of the law because of all these accursed gospels coming back in. And Paul, who I agree, you know, these people were thorns in his flesh. And he was having to go over and, and point them to Jesus Christ and what they were doing, you know, keeping the, the old covenant, you know, sacrifices and Levitical priesthood of dietary laws and washings and all these things were just for a shadow of things to come and that they never led to salvation. And so he gets on these Hebrews at the end of Hebrews 5 leading into Hebrews 6 1 and in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, so this is Paul speaking to these Hebrews, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Uh, and then goes on from there. So, you know, Paul is, is rebuking them for not maturing in the faith. You know, many of many of these brethren that are that have received Jesus Christ as their Savior had not, you know, um, got back under the law, but some have. And he was showing everything that they were doing were, were just dead works, you know. And and so that leads into Hebrews 6, 1, where he says, turn from those dead words. Quit doing that. You know, that has no life in it. And, you know, all these, all these, you know, people that are coming in with these false gospels, you know, who are thorns in my flesh, they are trying to get you back under the bondage of the law. But turn from that, you know, turn from those dead words in the law, which never had any life in the first place. And, 
be assured and mature in your faith. You know, look forward at the cross and what Jesus Christ did for you. Uh, and so that's what he's saying here. And, you know, well, we can we can talk a little bit more about this. We can even go down to the problem verse um, or passage, you know, just after this and talk about that for a minute. I'd love to do that. Um, but I'll turn it back over to you for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I think it would be very helpful for us to talk about the next verse. But I'd like to read all these verses here um, in the uh, that wonderful translation I keep on referring to, the, the uh, Amplified translation. Uh, some people probably going to turn off my their video right now there, but um, I've said this over and over again. Uh, we use the KJV as our scriptures. We look at the Amplified or another translation or a commentary or listen to another brother to get other insights on the verse, and we can agree or disagree. I mean, just because Brother Jason says something to me doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I, hey, let's say it's the Lord, but he has some insights that I don't have, and I can benefit from listening to his interpretation of the verses. And so it's the same thing. That's the same way that I like to use the Amplified translation, the Amplified Committee of whoever they are, scholars. Uh, they amplify their thoughts on the verses, and uh, sometimes it can be helpful. I thought in this particular case it might be helpful, so let's, let's look at it and see what it says. Therefore, let us get past the elementary stage in the teachings about the Christ. Advancing on to maturity and perfection and spiritual completeness, doing this without laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Um, I think I'm, before I go forward, and I'm going to comment on repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That's what salvation is. We're coming to the conclusion that our works are meaningless for our salvation. So just don't even ever bring up your works again. Don't ever boast about your works. Don't ever think that your works contribute one cent towards your salvation. Otherwise, you're spitting in the face of Jesus on that cross and say your death and suffering wasn't enough. Uh, I, so that's what this is really saying here. Um, without laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. So repent of that. Get over that. Don't ever think about your works as being any uh, think favorable for God in any way and 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 a faith towards God so what we got to do is stop thinking that our our works have any significance any importance any value and instead re just rely on your faith towards God of teaching about washings uh, the ritual purifications the laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment these are all important matters uh, in which you should have been proficient long ago. And we will do this, that is, proceed to maturity, if God permits. And then we get on to the, the, the verse, uh, verse 4. Uh, I'll read it in this trend, uh, Amplified first, and then you can go back to the KJV to discuss this important verse. Uh, For it is impossible to restore to repentance, those who have once been enlightened spiritually and who have tasted and consciously experienced the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted and consciously experienced the good word of God and the powers of the age, the world to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to bring them back again to repentance since they again nail the Son of God on the cross. For as far as they are concerned, they are treating the death of Christ as if they were not saved by it and are holding him up again to public disgrace. All right, brother. I think that was uh, a, a good interpretation of that. You know, I, the Amplify version there, I'll read it in the KJV verses four through six, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame 
So a lot of people will trust this and say, look, oh, you can lose your salvation. Look right here in Hebrews 6, verse 4, um, 5 and 6. But Paul is actually saying the very opposite. He's saying once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're eternally secure. You can't repent to him over and over. It's already been done. Once you've turned to him from dead works, repented from dead works, to faith toward God, you are given eternal life. You're made a partaker by the Holy Spirit. You're sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. And so he shows this hypothetical hypothetical situation of these, you know, um, Hebrews, which may have possibly trying to get back under the law. And it's, it's like, if you're going back under the law, you know, God died, Jesus died once and for all for you. You know, his sin penalty paid for all sins, past, present, and future. Don't get back under the law and sacrifice the the bulls and goats and calves. They, they don't save you. It's already been done. He's trying to get them to rest in the finished work of the cross. You know, he, he's saying, you know, don't trust, don't get back and trust in your own works, which never saved you. But trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you know, which saved you once and for all. And if you do get back and you're a saved believer in Christ and then your faith gets shipwrecked by all these people that are coming in and getting you back under the bondage of the law, what you're really doing when you do those works and are look and are doing those sacrifices is you're saying that Jesus has finished work on the cross isn't good enough for you. You're crucifying him every time you sacrifice a blood, the a bull or a calf or a goat. Um, you're, you know, you're. It says in another verse, you know, you try in the Son of God afresh every time you do that. Um, so he's saying, don't do that. And and so, you know, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. But this is this is showing the finished work of Jesus Christ as being enough for a believer. And lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. I would say now um, you called it a problem verse, a uh, problem, and, and and it is a problem in the Lordship salvation is what want to use this verse against us, but it's really a problem for them, not for us. For those of us who understand the verse correctly, this is not a problem. This is an eternal security verse, um, and the Book of Hebrews is is um, one of the great books comparable to Galatians, it's making the same point that it's faith alone, no works, no works. Don't even think about practicing Judaism again, okay? because you're crucifying Christ all over again if you start doing that. Uh, but the way we understand this verse, <clears throat> it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So if they're partakers of the Holy Ghost, these people are saved. So this is talking about it's impossible for someone who got saved and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If you know, This is saying it's impossible for this to happen. If they shall fall away, and that's, by the way, that's impossible. Uh, to renew them again unto repentance, that, that's all impossible, is what this is saying. Uh, uh, seeing they crucified the, to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So put him to open shame, I phrase it, you're spitting in the face of Jesus on the cross saying, that's not enough, Jesus, you didn't do enough. It's how insulting, and that's what this verse is saying. You, it, this is so insulting to Jesus. To have this kind of an attitude um, but at the beginning it says this is all impossible it doesn't work that way <clears throat> uh, uh, so if someone was going to believe that uh, this is a, a proof text for the uh, losing your salvation then right along with that doctrine they would have to also accept that uh, inescapable conclusion that uh, uh, this this verse is actually uh, a suicide, spiritual suicide for them, because there's not a single person who ever got saved, and from that moment forward never 
had any spiritual issues. They, I'm talking about some kind of sin where they committed a sin or they thought about something sinfully or they neglected to do something good, any kind of sin. There's no person that got saved and for the rest of their life, to their last breath, they never sinned. Or regarding faith, everybody has more faith and less faith at points in their lives. So if our faith is stronger or waning or even lost completely, you, this happens to everybody. Everybody has these, these issues in their, in their Christian life. So knowing that, this is suicide for the Lordship Salvation is because they, at some point after they get saved, they're going to sin. And what happens is this is saying it's impossible to get saved again. <laughs> You cannot get saved again. You can't repent. All of a sudden, you're saved again. It's not a teeter-totter, okay? I'm saved. I'm lost. I'm saved. I'm lost. No, you're, you're saved, and you can't get lost. And if you think you can get lost, it's impossible to get saved again. This is what this is saying. So, Lord Shippers, if you believe that this is saying that uh, it's impossible to uh, – um, uh, this is not eternal security verse, but but instead is saying that you can lose your salvation. Then you better understand. You better never sin one time in your whole life after you got saved. Otherwise, it's impossible for you to ever regain your salvation because Christ can't be crucified again. He was crucified once. He's not going to go back and get crucified again every time you feel like you want to repent and get saved again. So you're doomed. It's spiritual suicide the way they see it. Are you there? You, it looks like you're frozen. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just taking it all in. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's absolutely true. And you know, you either have to be so prideful that you're in that sinless perfectionist crowd. And I don't know too many lordshippers that are. You know, I think even somebody that says, well. You can't just live any way you want and are looking at, you know, the law instead of looking at what Jesus Christ did for them. But they will use willful sin or something like that. And, you know, I look at that as cheap law, you know, because they don't understand how good and perfect the law is and how that if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. And. You know, and and another verse for that is in Romans five three, or sorry, Galatians five three, which we covered before. But you know, I just want to make the point that you made. You know, about spitting in the the face of Jesus. You know, just imagine yourself being there on at Calvary, and you know, Jesus is hanging on that cross and saying, "It is finished." and I gave my life for you to pay for your sins. I paid it all. And you know that he is the Messiah from the scriptures that you read and trust. And then afterwards, if you walk away from that finished work on the cross and say, well, now that just means that I have the opportunity to have eternal life if I continue now to not sin anymore and and lead a life of obedience, then what you're really doing is when he died for you, you're crucifying him afresh every time you do that. You're trodden the foot, the son of God. You're spitting in his face um, saying it isn't good enough. You know, Jesus, your finished work on the cross isn't good enough for me. I, would, I still need to establish my own righteousness and prove my salvation and show you that I deserve it. Um, you know, and that goes down that line of, you know, hypocrisy and ultimately unbelief. Ultimately, you've never trusted in his finished work, what he did for you. So you're still in unbelief because you're trusting in yourself to a point. Yeah. And I'll emphasize one last time here. Uh, when you said that they crucify him again. Well, wait a second. That's what I want them to understand. It's impossible for you to crucify him again. That's what this verse is telling you. 
Therefore, you better not lose your salvation because you can't crucify him again and get, regain your salvation if you lose it. That's, if you think you can lose your salvation based on this verse, then you also have to conclude that you could never regain it. That's what this is saying. It's impossible to re-crucify him, so you better believe that, hey, you can't lose it. Because if you believe you can lose it, this verse says you cannot regain it because it's impossible to crucify him again. God, I hate the thought of that. I hate the thought of someone teaching that. I'm sorry. Sorry, brother. I'm about to lose it here all together. <laughs> oh, That's why I was so quiet previously. I was just soaking it all in. I saw, I mean, you're you're hammering this and, and I'm loving it. And so um, you know, keep teaching. Yeah. We'll do we'll do another video for this last verse if you want to keep going. <laughs> 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 so uh, we got one verse left. We'll do that, and we're on schedule here. We have like twelve minutes left, I think. And if I, do you remember how time we started? I think it's about twelve fifteen. So uh, I think we get time to do this verse, and then you can summarize, and we'll summarize the entire series in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, all right. Plus, I don't want to get any more agitated. <laughs> all right. This final verse here. Is 1 Timothy 1 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now this is Paul writing to Timothy. And you know, again, and this is this is showing the salvific role of Jesus Christ, that he is the anointed one. He is the Messiah that they were waiting on, uh, the Redeemer, the Deliverer to free us from our sins and give us eternal life and allow us to be reconciled into God's everlasting covenant through him and his finished work. Um and Paul understands that he was chief of sinners. You know, he was, and and that goes back to him using the law lawfully. He used it properly. He was trying to establish his own righteousness when he was saw and following it and trying to do every one of the 600 plus um, laws within the old covenant. But then after his, encounter on the road to Damascus with Jesus, you know, he realized that he wasn't doing it properly anyway, and that the law was never intended to be kept perfectly in order to receive salvation. And once he saw that the law was intended for, it leads him to this verse right here where he's saying, I'm the chief of sinners. You know, somebody that was following the law and was doing it better than anyone now understands he's a sinner and needs a savior. And put his faith in Jesus Christ and ended up maturing into probably the greatest apostle uh, and disciple as far as spreading the gospel that this world has ever seen, save Jesus. Um, and so this is a great verse to finish on. Well, um, of course, we, we have to keep in mind that people watching these videos, uh, we have varying degrees of biblical knowledge and levels. Some people are beginners complete novices, never read, haven't even read the Bible, or just beginning to, and other people study it their whole lives and know as much or, or more than we do. Uh, so with that in mind, I, I, I think it's, we have to t say that, look, why are you, to me, why, why is Paul saying he's chief of sinners? Well, I think he's reflecting on uh, uh, when he was Saul, the Pharisee, as you said, and, and he he uh, he understands now when he writes this, he understands now that 
he couldn't follow the law perfectly, but he did say in one of his letters at some point, he said he followed the laws as, as perfectly as, as well as anybody could. Nobody did it any better than him. And yet he also says that it's impossible to follow it perfectly. So if you want to be judged by the law, you're going to be guilty because no one could do it perfectly. Not even him, as, as, as hard as he worked at it. But I think when he says, I was chief of sinners, I think he probably never got over the guilty conscience, even though he knows that Jesus forgave him, sins are paid for. The thing that probably bothered him more than anything else was when he was given that letter, the authority to round up the Christians and persecute them. And he said he laid waste to the church. So now, what did he do? The Bible doesn't give you all the details, but I think what he did was he would find anybody who was a Christian, take them back and jail them, Maybe there was torture, maybe there was execution, but that's what he did to the church. To all those people who put their faith in Jesus, Paul, at that time known as Saul, he was the one that was hurting the church more than any other individual. So he, he probably thought of himself as chief of sinners that, look, who is worse than me? I tried to lay waste to the church of Jesus Christ. That's, that's how horrible I am. And yet, his grace is sufficient for me. He is all forgiving. He's, he's all sufficient, even for me, the chief of sinners that was bringing waste to the church. Even I got forgiveness and salvation. And that should be a message to anybody who's watching this video who thinks you're just too bad to be saved. Nobody's too bad to be saved. And that's the point Paul's making. He was destroying, personally destroying the church as best he could. And he got saved. And he, as you said, became, many of us believe, the greatest apostle. All right, brother. Amen. And just following up on that, earlier in 1 Timothy, if we go back just a few verses, in verse 8, Paul writes, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And so that's what he recognized. That's what we recognize as believers, that the law is perfect and we can't keep it perfectly. Therefore, it leads us, going back to the first passage, as a schoolmaster to Christ. And he goes on in verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So, you know, once you're a believer, you receive... God's righteousness. You're imputed God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. Uh, you go from unjust to just. You're justified just as if I hadn't done that, you know. Um, but it's for the lawless and disobedient. So the law is there for unbelievers so that unbelievers can see the transgressions that they've done and that they can't keep the law perfectly. Therefore, understand that they're a sinner and condemned in their sins and need a savior to lead them to Jesus Christ. And then it goes on that um, the law is for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, and this reminds us of First Corinthians six that Paul voices these this same sentiment to the church at Corinth, and he says in verse nine of First Corinthians six, "Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God?" And so you'll have the lordship salvationists that will say, "Look, you see right here, if you're unrighteous." you know, and are a sinner and you're living in sin, then you're not going to go to heaven. But unrighteous is an unbeliever that hasn't used the law lawfully and turned from unbelief or trusting in themselves to trusting in Jesus Christ and accepting his righteousness. Because once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're righteous and just in his eyes. You're justified. 
And so it goes on, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And that's true. But look at the next verse. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. That's how we're justified. Mm. That's how we go from being a sinner to being justified and being righteous in his eyes. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how our sins are washed. That's how we're forgiven. So nobody is above not being able to receive the forgiveness of sins, no matter what you've done. Just understand that you need a savior for what you've done and turn to Jesus Christ and he can save you. Um, so that's the... You know, the end of my thoughts on on that verse, and I get fired up because this is another verse that is twisted so much, just like we saw in Hebrews 6 when it's saying just the opposite. It's not pointing to that we're, you know, continuing to sin, but it's pointing to that though we once were sinners, Christ died for us. He committed his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and we receive his life. Um, you know, we don't give our life to him for salvation. We receive his life and what he did for us. I'm uh, physiologically going through some changes. I, I'm actually, I just can hardly control myself. I feel like jumping up and dancing. I'm so happy right now. Uh, but, uh, well, one last thought on this verse, and then we'll ask you to summarize everything. Uh, when he says, uh, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So, to the viewer, I was talking about you, and me, and Brother Jason, and every person who's ever lived except Jesus Christ is a sinner. And that's why Jesus came to save you. Because you were, you were in a helpless, hopeless situation. You had a sin issue, and that created a barrier between you and God. There could be no relationship. But Jesus paid for all of our sins. The sin problem is resolved. Now you can have this relationship with God, but only through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. That's what Jesus claimed. So if you understand that you're a sinner, then you understand your need for Jesus. Uh, if you think you're not a sinner, well, then you wouldn't need Jesus if you're not a sinner. But if you think you're not a sinner, then at minimum you're deluded and very likely you're actually insane. <laughs> so we're all sinners, but everyone sins are paid for because of Jesus. Um, all right, I, I, I'm going to summarize uh, kind of the whole series here in a minute, but uh, uh, I, I like your your thoughts on these verses, and then give me your thoughts on the whole series, and then I'll be giving my thoughts on the whole series, and we'll be done. Well, I thought this was a great ending to this series, and I'm kind of sad that it's over. Um, we did, you know, we did the first video. I look back in May 15th, and we covered one verse or two verses uh one passage ephesians 2 8 9 and we spent a whole hour on just that passage and then we had a few days until our next video and so i was thinking when we started that this may take over a year or two uh at the pace that we started but we finished this in three and a half months and covered a lot of ground um i think it was maybe close to 30 videos uh so 30 you know almost 30 hours and you know i just hope that all these verses and all the discussions that these verses have led to will help somebody that is unsure or questioning, you know, if God exists or if salvation is found through Jesus Christ to uh, allow them to soften their heart, plant that seed so that they will turn from dead works or whatever else they're trusting in and turning to Jesus Christ as their savior. And for those that 
are believers and watch these videos. Hopefully it will be edifying to you and strengthen your faith um, so that you can go out and lead others to Christ and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I think, you know, the whole sum of this series um, is for unbelievers and believers alike. I think we can all gain something from it. Um, so I'll just finish with, you know, to summarize the whole thing, you know, John three sixteen, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God loves us all, but to receive that love, to be reconciled into that relationship, we must receive that love through Jesus Christ and faith in him. Um, that's how we are restored to God. That's how our sins are forgiven uh, forever. And that's how we receive eternal life. Um, so, you know, to sum up before you sum up, just, um, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, uh, first, I just want to thank you again for um, working on this with me. Can't think of anybody that uh, I would have preferred to, to have team up with me on this project. So thank you so much. I look forward to all the other plans we have in the future. Um, now, I, I reflected on the whole thing and how we started. And I remember in the first video, one of the points that uh, I wanted to make is that there is a, a, a right way uh, a wise way to study the Bible and and form our conclusions or our doctrines, our doctrinal positions. And one thing we should never do is form a doctrine on a verse that is vague and debated and everybody's arguing about what does that mean? All kinds of different opinions on the verse. We, instead, we should we should um, conclude our, our, our doctrinal positions on the verses that are clear cut and specific and inescapable. That that it, it clearly states one thing; it can have no other meaning. And uh, many of the verses on this series, that's the kind of verse it is. It's clearly saying that you're saved by faith, and then nothing else is mentioned. It only mentions faith. It only mentions believing. Nothing else is included. It says, this is how you get saved, just faith. So those verses are all proof texts for you're saved by faith alone because the word faith appears alone. So those people said, who say, show me and where in the Bible it says you're saved by faith alone. <laughs> Every verse, 100, 200, 300, 400 verses, whenever it says you're saved by faith or believing and there's nothing else mentioned, that's it's saying you're saved by faith alone. So. Put on your brain and, and, and think about that. And now, thankfully, we have the Apostle Paul that takes it a step further, and he provides all these verses that saying, you're saved by faith, and don't you dare add anything else to it, or you've ruined it. Don't even think you can get saved by a combination of faith and works. So uh, those are the kinds of verses that we've been uh, discussing in this series. So a doctrinal conclusion if you're going to really trust it, uh, it should be based upon verses that are clear cut and not ambiguous. And those are the verses we provided you here. It should also be, uh, be uh, determined by uh, the, a, a, a thought, a, a doctrine that's repeated over and over again. We provided 101. If we wanted to, we could go by verse by verse in the book of John and provide probably 100 loans from the book of John. Oh, throughout the Bible, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that, uh, that we have to conclude that we're saved by grace, grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And if that is repeated so many times, we can have confidence that that's the correct doctrine. And we should not be pulled away into a damnable heresy that works are required for salvation because there's a, a handful of verses that the Lordship heritage are using to prop up their unholy position. Uh, so that I would say is uh, hopefully uh, that's a reminder that 
Uh, and that's what I hope that we've accomplished in this series is to show you that don't let the Lordship heretics deceive you. As Paul says in the book of, of Galatians, even if an angel comes to you with another doctrine, it's, um, it's anathema. It's a lie from the devil. Okay? Uh, so, I, I, and again, I'll say this again, and, and it's not to promote my videos or anything on my channel. I, it's, it's for the benefit of those people who need it. Please share the playlist with everybody who needs to hear these, this. So, brother, um, that's my final thought. I'll give you, let me give you the last word. If you have any just like closing thought, and then we'll, we'll end this. Well, I just want to thank you for inviting me to do this, this series. Uh, I think it was a very important series, and I'm glad that I was a part of it. And I learned from you so much in these last three and a half months, and hopefully I contributed something to this um, series. And, you know, I hope this is one of many of upcoming series over the next few months and even years. And uh, God willing, we'll continue to do this. Um, you know, as fellow brothers in Christ to, you know, point to Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and um, all praise to him. To him be the praise. Amen. Yeah, that's a good uh, final thought here. Uh, all praise, all glory, sola gloria to Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and salvation by Grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is the only way that Jesus gets all the glory. You can't claim any glory. Bless you all for watching. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.